and welcome to Unwarranted Music Opinions. I'm June Lindberg here with Brian Courtney. Hello. Who can't talk into his mic. Chaz Jenkins. Hello. And our interview guest of the evening, Eric Herlock of Ten Bird Choir. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hey there. Uh, So we have talked about one of your albums on the show. That's Old Machines, a bit of a compilation of sorts of tracks recorded in an an almost two decade time period between 92 and 2006 released in 2012 Chaz just sort of brought this to us uh as he does sometimes where he just throws a record at us that we have no clue about so we didn't really know what to think but we all ended up really enjoying it uh so getting a hold of you is kind of one of those uh, wonderful little surreal moments where we, you get to kind of meet someone whose art has had uh, some kind of impact with you, which is really cool. But first things first, before we get into any kind of big interview, uh, this I just always like to start with, how you doing? Like, this has been a long year for a lot of people. Um, we're finally into 2021. Uh, where, where are you sitting at right now? Yeah, well, it, it was a crazy year. Um, I am outside of Philadelphia. Um, I've been working from home, you know, since March of 2020, you know, I'm here with my wife and my two kids and my dog and my cat. And so it's been, you know, relatively peaceful here at home. Um, but you know, we're still trying to work from home, teach our, you know, our kids go to cyber school and it's a lot. I'm ready for it to be over. I don't even know what normal is like anymore. So to say like, I want to get back to normal, like, what's that mean? Mm. Uh, but all in all, doing okay. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, maintaining a good headspace through all of this. You know, try to be creative, try to be, you know, in, you know, make connections with the people that are meaningful in my life and, you know, just taking it one day at a time. But I thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, it was just a, an amazing honor to get that message from Chaz saying, hey, we reviewed your your album. And it was like, you know, it struck me, you know, it, it appealed to my raging narcissism and like the humility at the same time. It's like, it was completely humbling and like mind blowing at the same time, because no one has ever really done any sort of analysis of my songwriting. And so it was very surreal and I loved it. I loved, uh, I loved hearing about it. I really enjoyed like the sort of the dynamic the three of you have together. Oh, it's in a dynamic, all right. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, very, very passionate and thoughtful. And um, I appreciate that. So again, thank you for this honor of having me here on your show. Anytime, Eric. It's just awesome that you had such a connection with and were willing to talk to us about it. When you, when I messaged you, you even mentioned that you hadn't thought of the particular record we talked about in a long time. How was it? Not only did we talk about your music, but that particular record, what was that feeling like? Uh, That was really funny because like in my mind, this wasn't really a record. It was just a collection of little, you know, home recordings that I, you know, put together and stuck on Bandcamp. Yeah. I mean, those songs span a very, you know, big stretch of my life from when I was, what, like 18 or 19 until I was, you know, in my, well into my 30s. So that was fun. And like hearing you talk about it as a, you know, like a work of art, like a, a complete collection, I went back, you know, I've listened to it once since the, um, since your podcast. And it has this continuity, you know, like the order of the songs, it tells a story that I never really even considered. And so it was neat to see it through your eyes and ears. And, uh, Again, thank you. (laughs) What's it like to have something that you made brought back up into your mind after so long? Where does that put you just like mentally and emotionally thinking about like, whoa, like it's kind of transportative, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, each one of those songs, I could probably tell you a very lengthy, boring story about each one of those songs on there. Um, Mm -hmm. So the beginning of the record, there's 
spies and messiahs and codeine, right? They're these really poorly recorded, like you said, like there's a guy in his room with his crappy keyboard and his guitar. And uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. But there is a, can I tell you like a little bit of the backstory? On Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the year is 1992. I had just finished my freshman year of college at Temple University in Philadelphia. Temple is in, you know, it's urban. It's very urban. And I grew up very rural. So I spent a year there and it was like maybe a little too much for, you know, young, sensitive Eric and, uh, had a lot of soul searching to do when I when I came home from college that year, and I I got a job painting houses with student painters, right? Like that group where like they get college students to paint houses. And buckle up, this is a, a, a tangent I'm taking you on here. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> and, we're good. Uh, I was with the crew, and we were staining somebody's deck, right? And suddenly I get this headache. And I have this crazy headache. I'm like, guys, I have a headache. I have to go home. And they're whatever. So I, I go home and this headache just gets worse and worse. And uh, there's some vomiting. This is probably too much. You can edit this out if you want. <laughs> and so my mom takes me to the hospital at like midnight, right? And I'm in the hospital and they don't know what's going on. And they think it might be meningitis. And they start giving me like spinal taps and all this like crazy stuff. And I don't know what's going on. I'm just in a lot of pain. They can't figure it out because, you know, it's a rural Pennsylvania hospital, maybe not the best doctors in the world. And after a couple of days, they just send me home, like without any sort of diagnosis. But they give me a bottle of codeine, right? So I'm on codeine for the pain and I couldn't go to work. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do? So I borrowed a friend's four track recorder, like one of those old Tascam four track machines. And just whacked out on Cody and I just start making up songs and like playing them. So what you hear there, uh, the Spies and Messiahs is this just weird song that sort of came out of a Codeine dream. And that song that's actually called Codeine is, you know, kind of like a aftermath uh, kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like very autobiographical. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I put together like, you know, it might have must have been 10 songs. I had them on tapes and I gave them out to people. I'm like, hey, I made this when I, I eventually like got better. I was no longer on codeine and uh, sort of got back to normal. But so I had all these songs and they sort of, you know, kind of like faded off into uh, whatever. And years later, I stuck them on this compilation. I guess um, conceiving of this project as a compilation of songs spanning such a long period of time. Um, and there are only 10 songs here, and I'm sure you wrote probably much more than 10 songs over the course of that time. What made you decide to put these tracks on this album? That's a great question. Around the time, like slightly before I published it on Bandcamp, one of my old bandmates said he found a CD that I had given him about four years before that. And it was these songs. So I had made this homemade CD. I gave it to him. He gave it back to me and saying, Hey, these are pretty neat. And I had forgotten about them. I put them on the computer and uploaded them. So it was pretty much just like, yeah, I didn't feel like I had much to sort of happen. It just sort of fell together. Cause right. it was recorded from 1992 to 2006 and then uploaded six years later in 2012. I was going to ask, right. When did you feel like it was appropriate to release these songs since th there's such a length of before it was released? I don't know. Just he, uh, in, it was around 2012 that, you know, our old bandmate gave us the CD back and I was like, oh, I should put these on Bandcamp because I think Bandcamp was relatively new at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were just, just putting stuff up, you know, like just to see what would stick. Yeah, so Eric, we talked a little bit before the show. We just kind of mentioned some stuff uh, that we'll get into. But uh, I mentioned to you how I found the album. Our general manager at our old radio station where we used to work at WMKY gave me a sticker of your band. And then I went on your band camp and found the album. I was wondering if you even knew like how your music or merchandise would have ended up in Kentucky from Philadelphia. Uh, if you even had anything to do with that. We made two stickers over the course of our band. And one was like a Pennsylvania Dutch kind of hex sign. And the other was like this weird little cartoon bird. So if it's the bird sticker, then we sent that out in, I would say, 2009. We had our first record. It was called Barn Rock. 
and we did this like radio campaign. We we worked with uh, like a guy who was like he used to be an A and R guy, and now he like he does he works with bands, and he gave us this list. He's like, here, send CDs and whatever else you can to all these radio stations, <laughs> and you know for a little bit it, we had like we were like charting on some kind of weird you know like alt country chart or something, and there was you know, um, public radio stations playing us in North Carolina and California. And it was exciting, but, you know, there's no money to be made in that, right? It was just like exciting to connect with people. Mm -hmm. So that's how it, I think that's how it ended up there in Kentucky. That makes sense, yeah. But do you know when you got that sticker? I can, I think I mentioned this in the episode. So when I really picked up guitar, this is when I was in high school. Okay, so this is. It has to be at least 2011. I think because okay. well, the album was out. The album was out when I found it, so it's after 2012, maybe 2013. Oh, okay. That's when I'm going to say 2013 because I started getting onto Bandcamp okay. around that time. Uh, Dude and Brian know. Probably okay. had just a load of stickers. When he learned that I was playing guitar, dishing out the stickers, so he probably had those stored away from 2009 when he got your your stuff and then just started giving me to them that that would be my my guess but probably when i found your old machines you probably had that album wasn't probably a year old at that point when i found it cool well i'm glad you found it i'm concerned that your what station manager or what did you call him general manager he thinks that general manager that like stickers are going to help you play guitar but, i mean i guess it, it, it brought us together so who am i to judge? oh right? yeah if he hadn't given me that i probably would have never found your group speaking of which i wouldn't have picked your album if it wasn't for that amazing album cover please explain the story behind that Ama- <laughs> I, it's one of my favorites it's absolutely great oh i wish i had a great story i wish that there was a great story there but it was really just like the desk upstairs in our old house there was a blue wall there was our you know, Buddha statue and my old Tascam tape machine. And I just snapped a picture. Just, <laughs> that in it. I feel like I'm disappointing you no, again. Oh, no. I mean, it's still cool. I like, recreate no, it. I still that's have just all kind of how things. it goes. <laughs> but I, I never really like thought much about it. But since I heard you sort of gush about that photo a little bit, I went in and like zoomed in and looked at it. And yeah, there's it's some neat colors. I, yeah, I love that. Lucky on that it's one. It's just out of all of your stuff, that one immediately caught my eye compared to the rest not saying like the other album art isn't cool or anything it's just that that's my eyes went straight to that one and like i said i started listening to to some of the stuff and i was immediately hooked so i guess my next question is your debut barn rock dropped in 2009 two of the tracks off Mm -hmm. old machines in a more updated actual produced are on there but you didn't release any of the other demos until way later. So what made you pick those two songs and why did your style change? Cause obviously if you listen to old machines and listen to your stuff, it's very different. So, you know, where did all the, the, that kind of come from? The style change, uh, you mean playing with a band is a collaborative experience. Um, recording by yourself at home is not collaborative so much. So my style there on the home recordings is just me, you know, like whatever that is. But then bring the songs to the band and it sort of opens things up a little bit. You know, we have a bass player and a drummer. My wife sings in the band. And uh, so, yeah, things just changed. I mean, that song, uh, the two songs you're talking about are Small Eyes and Where Did I Go Wrong? Where Did I Go Wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Where Did I Go Wrong? I that's a really old song. I think I wrote that in 92 and recorded that version in 93. But then years later, you know, t- almost 20 years later with the band, we we started playing it and um, I offered that song to my wife to sing because she's just a, like a gifted singer and I don't consider myself a singer at all. So like I was, you know, wanted her to sing the songs. And so it, it came out of that. So the, the style definitely changed because of the collaborative nature of playing with a band. The Small Eyes song is relatively close in feel. Well, actually, no, maybe not. It's closer in feel to the demo than the other one was. But yeah, just playing with people brings in a whole other set of ideas and palettes and things like that. Was there anything in particular about those two songs that 
uh made you pick them to re-record or was it, or was it just that you know were they favorite because the, to me they were my favorites off of the record so i thought it was interesting that you had picked those two did you did you believe in them any more than the other songs or maybe did they just have a quality to them like you know what, what was maybe something that made you go back to them yeah um i really liked the lyrics of both of them i thought they were pretty strong but then you know there are several other of our band songs that I also have old recordings of that, you know, sort of changed over mm. the years. I think when we were starting the band, we were just like, what, all right, what songs do you have? You know? And so we just like <laughs> pulled out and tried whatever worked. And, um, you know, some sort of came across better with the band than others. So in our discussion, yeah. we, we kind of debated a little bit about, you know, if it was just you doing all this music or if you had help, did any of the original Timber Choir members ever help you with any of these old songs in, in its recording period? Or is it all just you? Uh, that is a great question. Would you mind if I pulled up the track list just to have something to... Not at all. Go for it. Here? I have it pulled up on my monitor. <laughs> but I do, you know, it was, it was it's funny because looking back at it, uh, like smokes at the Wawa and stuff. Like it's, I mean, it's been a while since I've listened to this thing. Uh, I haven't yeah. listened to it since last year. If I remember right, you year, love smokes at the Wawa, right? What's that? Those, it was like small eyes. Where did I go wrong? And smokes at the Wawa were my favorite songs that I remember. And I still remember them to this day. Like I can remember how they sound. For me, it was probably chase away ghost cigarette song and healing time. Those right. one, two, three, but we'll get into like, We'll let you uh, answer Chaz's question, but after that, I'm going to want to ask about, like, we mentioned several artists mm -hmm. as potential. Yeah, we talked about, or, we had talked about uh, this too. We had talked about mm -hmm. this too. I was like, was any of our uh, comparisons uh, spot on? And But I'll let Eric uh, give his answer about yeah, that. That's, that's basically the question I want to ask. But it's we'll, funny. We'll get through Chaz's first. Yeah, it's funny because asking about influences is normally something, you know, it's like, ah, it's kind of an old cliche question. Like, who are your, but this one was actually kind of curious, you know, because this is a. We all how, like had a it, list of different artists that we like compared your, your work to, you know, as inspirations. Yeah. But anyway, so my, my original right, so question was. Uh, see the track list now. What's yeah, the okay. Question? The question was, uh, did any of your, like, uh, did any of the Timber Choir members ever help you with any of these songs during its recording process? Or was it all just you? Because we had talked about that in our discussion. The only other human being appearing on this collection is in Where Did I Go Wrong? There's a harmony part being sung, but that is not by anyone from my band. That was like a childhood friend who I knew could sing harmony. I was like, Bill, come over and, and sing on this. <laughs> and, and he did. And I think like that harmony, you're like really like makes it. Like, I don't think it, it would be the yeah, same recording. Yeah, it makes the song sound. He's, it, I don't know. When I'm thinking about it, is he like, like, yeah, there's two voices clearly going, one's a little bit higher than the other. That to me, that's spot on. It does make it stand out. It's when, it's my favorite part of the record, probably. We yeah, all really was... uh, enjoyed Smokes at the Wawa, and that's my personal favorite song. I mean, I love the whole record. You, you heard my rating. I love the whole record, but Smokes at the Wawa is like one of my favorite songs. It's such a great song. Well, thank you. Um, I enjoyed hearing it again uh, after listening to your show. <laughs> Uh, it had been a while, but yeah, that's the the, the wa Do you know what the Wawa is? Walmart. <laughs> so no. Oh, really? Or is it an actual like? I thought it meant for Walmart. That that was my guess. Uh, no. <laughs> Smokes at the Walmart. In, I didn't have a guess. There's a convenience store chain called Wawa. It's uh, like southeastern Pennsylvania. I was to say it's got to um, be a Pennsylvania thing because I don't think there's anything like that in Kentucky. I think they've got a few stores in Florida, but it's mostly just like the mid-Atlantic. And there's sort of a, a rivalry in the state between a store called Sheets and then the Wawa. It's like some people, they're Wawa people, some people are Sheets people. Yeah, I You're a Wawa guy, Wawa, clearly, right? uh, based on the song. You are a Wawa <laughs> guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you haven't heard my Christmas song, Christmas at the Wawa, have you? Oh, no, oh, that sounds shit. amazing. Is it, please tell me it's literally- sort of like the, a sister song. Please tell me it's literally the kind same of. song, just lyrical changes. It's the same oh. melody, everything, just the different <laughs> lyrics. Please tell me. No, it's Dang. much sadder. No. It's a sad nah. song. Nah. Mm -hmm. um, the Wawa is thought... going out of business. <laughs> I thought that you booked this interview like well after Christmas, so maybe we didn't have to talk about the Christmas songs, but it's okay. <laughs> Clearly not. It wasn't. 
Well, our recent that. episode we're coming up. Oh. June picked a Christmas album, so you know, go figure. Yeah. Yeah, timing's not really yeah. our strong suit, I don't think. Right. So to right. reiterate June's previous question, we made a ton of musician comparisons. Like, what inspired you? Were any of them spot on, or you know, did you have a completely different list I, of inspirations of your songwriting process and whatnot? I wrote them down. Um, John Prine, for sure. John Prine, yes. I, I had never heard yes. him. I was about 15 years old. I was at the Philadelphia Folk Festival, and I heard John Prine for the first time. It's like, what is this? And actually, I didn't hear him singing. I heard, remember I mentioned my friend Bill, who was singing that harmony? Him and his dad mm -hmm. would, would sit at their campsite and sing John Prine songs, like in two-part harmony, and it was just mind-blowing. And then so from there, you know, I started obviously listening to John Prine and uh, I still have a couple of his songs in my repertoire that I will play. But yeah, definitely a big influence. Jeff Tweedy, I can't say that he's a, a big influence. Um, I do enjoy some of his stuff, but I don't know much of it. I was into uh, Uncle Tupelo for a little bit and, you know, I know Sunvolt too, but I'm not like diehard Wilco fan um, but I definitely like respect what they're doing and when I hear their tunes I'm like oh yeah I should be more into this but I don't know haven't gotten there yet you mentioned the mountain goats and what's his name Dan uh, David Berman da yeah there you go and he recently passed away again I, I don't I'm not familiar with him really at all um, I feel like I heard him on Fresh Air with Terry Gross a couple years ago, and that might have been my introduction to him. Um, but clearly, I have got homework to do. So thank you for that. Um, do you mind me going down the list, or did you want to bring up Absolutely. The no, yeah, this is you. great. It, you. Once you go through them, though, tell us what were your inspirations on the making of, okay. uh, the during your process of making this album? Yeah. Sure. You mentioned Daniel Johnston. And I'm not familiar with much of his music, but I definitely know sort of his reputation. And then Kaufman and Kabor, like that, I had never heard of them at all. Oh, and wow. I, just the other day, I listened to what it was like songs from Suicide Bridge, like mm -hmm. maybe their first, like, so it was like a home recording. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I love that you heard all of this in my music. And uh, yeah, it just sort of like reiterates the point that we're all connected, you know? So, yeah, I don't know. Shame about um, our batting average though, on the guesses there, you know, I mean, really we got one, right? I don't know, but I, <laughs> I mean, if I can, if I can recommend Coffin and Kabor, I mean, that record's pretty fantastic. So I'm glad I'm able to spread the enjoyment. Absolutely. Uh, and John yeah. Prime, we got that right. We all, we yeah. knew Were there was there a little bit that of that country. -esque, we like, said, we mentioned Willie humor. Nelson, maybe. Are you a Willie Nelson fan? I, am absolutely but was not at the time like i mm. you know i grew up in the 80s right and like country music was like no you didn't want to listen to country music in the 80s and so i was <laughs> resistant to it uh, but then you know like years later it was in probably 1998 i heard hank williams senior like like heard it for the first time. I had probably heard yeah. him before, but I mean like heard it. And it was, you know, it was like the whole world opened up at that point. And then mm -hmm. from there started, you know, getting into some classic country, like Willie Nelson, Redhead to Stranger. I love that record. Like there's, a, it's yes. so, you know, he's so good. He's an American treasure for sure. But at the time of writing or recording any of these, not so much. So what were some of the music you were listening to around the time you were recording most of these tracks? What was your big, uh, like, influences? Music for me, like, sort of opened up when I was 10 and I was given Rubber Soul by the Beatles. You know, it was like this really well-placed Christmas present. Um, it was the year that, it was the Christmas after my father died. So I was, you know, just like, I don't know, and then... I was given the Beatles and it was like the best gift ever. Right. And so the Beatles are always going to be like top influence for, for most things because they're the Beatles at the time of these early ones. After that freshman year of college, I came home from college with like a bunch of fish tapes 
right? Oh my god. Cool. June's Hell a huge, wow. yeah. huge fish. We're, we both are, yeah, but she's, I she's grew the big up, fish fan. I grew up on fish. That was the first band that got me into music was fish. Okay. I remember cool. listening to fish and that was like the first album I ever was like, mom, can I have that CD? It, it was like 12 or something. That fish was a band. Um, I had oh, yeah. um, Lawn Boy and Junta on cassette tape. And I would listen to them on my Sony walk yeah. when I walked, you know, to so school awesome. and everything. Nice. Um, Were you also not to... Grateful Dead at all? Well, <laughs> that's a nice not... no, you know. Like... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hold on. There's, you know, there's some nuance here. Um, my very first concert <laughs> as a human being was a Grateful Dead show. But was I a deadhead? No. Um, do I enjoy listening to live shows? Not so much, but do I have a healthy appreciation for the dead and what they were culturally? Yes. Do I love Jerry Garcia and his playing? Yes, absolutely. But I'm not what you would call a, a deadhead. I'm not even a, a fish head anymore. And oh, okay. uh, June, forgive me for this, but it was in 1993 mm. when um, they had an album, maybe it was called Hoist. Does that sound right? Yeah, mm -hmm. Hoist. That was the album that got me into music. That was the one. That actually. was the album that got me out of fish. I was like, "Oh, I see where this is going," and I just stopped. Yeah. I just like wasn't in the fish anymore. I think I saw them I one more time up. in concert, but mm -hmm. yeah, they definitely like got into there. Like I can put on, you know, one of those early albums now, and like each one of those guitar notes is like ingrained in there. Mm -hmm. You know, like you know, run like an antelope or stash or something like that. You know, it's like yeah. So that was the fish stuff. Where? What else? What else was I listening to? Music and I have had a very sort of strange relationship over the years. You know, like I, I had records and I had tapes and then I had the CDs and I had this great big book of CDs. And now I just can listen to whatever I want on my phone whenever I want. And so I'm, I'm all over the place now. But back then, you know, I... I, I feel bad saying this, but in the 80s, it was like classic rock. Like they forced it on you. Like they sold you this idea of the 60s that like this was the best thing ever. And all the radio stations in the, in the late 80s were all like just jamming this stuff down your throat. And I never want to hear some of that stuff again, most of that stuff again. But also like because of the Beatles, I got into like 50s rock and roll, you know, like Gene Vincent and Buddy Holly. And then from there somehow made it to like Chicago blues and got into like the chess record stuff. And then we just listened to Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters all the time. Like that was my jam for a long time was this like Chicago style blues. Never quite made it to like the country blues, uh, but really liked that urban, you know, Chicago style blues of the the forties and fifties. How has the relationship between you and recording music changed since maybe the beginning of writing these songs? Like from the beginning of this album in 1992 to the end of this album in 2006, what was that like? What was the difference in your relationship between you and recording music? Definitely got, you know, better at using the equipment. You know, in the very early days, it was just, you know, it was very awkward. And, you know, I, I sort of maybe gained a confidence in my abilities to sing, which I don't think I've held on to. Like, I still don't feel like a, a singer at all. But by the end of this, the major change was that, and this affected my songwriting, I think, is that by in 2007 is when we actually started a band. And because I had never considered performing any of these, like it was never a thought. Like I was just a songwriter. I made songs, I recorded them. It was just like a thing I did. I never really considered performing them. But once we started a band, I was in my thirties at this point. It sort of changed how I, how I wrote songs because then suddenly you have to like consider the band you're playing with and an audience and things like that. Um, so these songs are all like safely in that part of my life where I didn't perform at all. So it was a very safe environment. The technology changed for me a little bit. You know, the early days, it was just like a very basic tape machine. And then by the end of these, it was very basic digital multi-track recorder. Um, none of these were recorded, you know, in like, like GarageBand or Pro Tools. It was all like you had to see everything in your ears. 
Um, mm -hmm. Whereas now I record on GarageBand and I can see everything. And I remember back in these days going like, I wish I could just see this stuff. It would be a whole lot easier if I could line things up. For most of these, I was using borrowed equipment. I would borrow a four track mm -hmm. from somebody, but by the end I had my own machine. Like it took me years to realize that I could just go buy stuff. You know, maybe it's because I was just always a poor musician or whatever. So that was the main thing that there would always be this like, time crunch it's like okay you have it for a week or you have it for two weeks so you got to get in and and make stuff while you have it whereas now it's like you can work on things over weeks months years mm -hmm. even but i think that definitely sort of influenced even how i approach stuff now um because it's a lot of improv you know it's like you go in and you just like see what you can do at the time like none of these songs were like labored over for very long what have you been working on lately with the COVID? You know, we have so much free time on our hands. Have you been working on any music? Has Timber Choir, the band, been working on any music? You know, what's the, what prospects? Do you still just write songs for yourself, like just to make them record? I still do recording. I've been working on like just instrumental things at this point. Um, I haven't really written many lyrics lately. I became a father like 12 years ago and like that, I don't know if that like slowed down my writing process a little bit sometime because I don't have that like lateral drift time that you sometimes need to just develop ideas and think about stuff. Cause I'm always like, you know, making somebody a sandwich or like whatever, you know, whatever dad stuff mm -hmm. I do. I'm not blaming my kids for my lack of songwriting. Okay. <laughs> But you totally are blaming your kids for... <laughs> In a way. No, I love my children. And uh, yeah, so I have a little bit, you know, just a different relationship with free time at this point. Over the, the course of the pandemic, I've been yeah, making sort of instrumental things. And that ties in with my job. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about my job, but I, I record a podcast talk myself. For my, I'm a journalist. Mm -hmm. I work for a farming newspaper. But a couple of years ago, I decided that we needed to do a podcast about industrial hemp. It was like before your boy Mitch McConnell got the farm bill through and all that stuff. And we won't claim him as our boy. That is not my boy, boy. Yeah. He's yours. You Look, elected him. We didn't ask your for problem. this boy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whose boy let is just, this? Let me just say that as of today, he is the minority leader. Boom. These yep. boom. As we are recording this in this major historical yes. event, it's about damn time. Yeah. And nothing yeah, bad today. happened in America after that either. Oh, like, totally. Literally, that was the end of all the bad things. <laughs> that was it, it's, a, it's peaceful. <laughs> yeah. It's peaceful right now. Very it's been smooth oh, going let's, let's ever hope. since then. Literally no nothing at all. I'll drink Hold on, I'm seeing something on the news here. Uh, this this, turn, this, that no, turn that off. Turn that off. See, day. see, see, I need to be, uh, I need to have a glass of wine or, or whatever, bourbon or whatever it is you have right now. <laughs> Eric. This actually is kombucha and... Oh, you know, uh, I thought you were saying some G well, shit bourbon, like, it's, it's just Kool-Aid. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> it's just Kool-Aid. Yeah, I drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> uh, wait, what was the question? There was a great question. You were uh, talking about oh, the industrial uh, hemp podcast you're doing oh what i'm doing now in the mm -hmm. right so i do this hemp podcast and i talk to people all over the country about industrial hemp but like my secret love about the whole thing is that i also do the music you know like i wrote the theme mm -hmm. song and i do all like you know when i go into the little news bits i've got the background music and the outro music and, and i bet your members appreciate I, I bet your members appreciate the time and effort you take to make music for the show and edit the show well, instead of dogging it every freaking yeah. new episode <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the key thing here is, you know, the, I mean, his music, it's probably, I don't want to be hard. It might be good. You know, his is probably good. And, like, you know, and the thing we got, look, Jazz, I blame you. I don't blame that band. I blame you. You probably told them, like, play this like Weezer. And that was it. And then we were fucked. Like, after that. Wait, you hired me? I went on Fiverr and got a few people to make some stuff. He me. went on Fiverr. <laughs> oh, cost me it's about even better. Cost me about twenty five dollars to get twenty five dollars. <laughs> wow. Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh. That's twenty five dollars you ever spent for my pleasure. Go ahead, Eric. Sorry. <laughs> it keeps on giving. 
the thing about the music on my podcast is that I don't actually take credit for it. I always say the music is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. That's Ooh. like my alternate. Oh, heck thing. yeah. It's like, so I like yeah. it. Yeah. That actually, so, so where did the name Tin Bird Choir come from? Well, that's a good question too. And it also has a Kentucky connection. Oh, nice. Yeah. You ready for this? Absolutely. Um, right. There is a writer, agrarian, poet, philosopher by the name of Wendell Berry. You familiar with him? Can't say that I, I am. I think I am, but I've not heard the Barry. name. Think. No. Oh, he's like your most famous Kentuckian. He's got a, a collection of poetry and actually a poem called A Timbered Choir, T-I-M-B-E-R-E-D, Timbered. And someone was over at our house and we were talking about this and my wife misheard the name and she said Tin Bird Choir. And we were like, oh, maybe maybe that, that's the name. Um, actually, I think she chose that for the name of the band. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's uh, I've had sort of an awkward relationship with the name of the band since then. It's like, it's weird. It's a weird name. It doesn't like... I don't know. I think people might think we're like Christian rock or something because we have a fire <laughs> in it. I don't. Right. I don't know. And so that's where it comes from. It's uh, Wendell Berry. It's it's sort of a mishearing cool. of a, a Wendell Berry. Book. <laughs> that's such yeah. a perfect band name story because <laughs> one of my personal favorites. I don't know if you're familiar with the group Chumba Wumba, but it's a group we've talked about a couple times on the show. They always like to make up a different story when someone asks them. Uh, where their band name come from. Every time they're asked that, they come up with a different story. But I think the actual story is we just a random thing we came up with. You know, like, so I guess they were like, oh, that's not exciting. So we'll just come up with something crazy for every time that. uh, Right. But then as soon as you pick a band name and it sticks and then like you're stuck with it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's that until you go solo and use your real name or something. Well, to me, a good name spawns if it's original. Like, there's nobody else named Tin Bird Choir out there. So, I mean, you've got yourself a winner. I don't know. I think what? Tin Bird Choir evokes a certain rural imagery, and that fits with the music, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I, don't know what, I didn't have any, like, preconceived notions about the name when I saw it, I don't think. And now I just attach it to that old machines, you know. So, it, it kind of, you know, it the music kind of transcended the name. It's just sort of yeah. like what the music is, you know what I mean? Like, it's what the music is attached right. to at this point to yeah. me. But I could definitely I see mean, how someone might think it's like, I mean, choir means like group, you know, I could see how that could come yeah. about. Like in my mind, none of these songs are Tin Bird Choir songs, like as they appear mm. on that thing, but there's no name for it. It's just me. So the other, like you're asking if Tin Bird Choir is doing anything during the. Uh, yeah. You mentioned some of your personal stuff. How, has your group been on? I know the last thing you released was 2019 was a Christmas song. Have you been working on anything yeah, since then? I haven't been, but my wife, Heather, has been just like prolific lately. She's been writing lots of amazing songs and then going into our little studio and just making, you know, demos. So that's the most exciting musical thing that our, our band is involved with at this point. And it's not even the band. It's just her and she's just incredible she's sort of tapped into something Mm -hmm. uh right now which i really just encourage and i love what she's doing and i assume your group's hoping to play live again once uh things calm down yeah maybe someday i i love to play with the band i love practices more than shows i know that might sound weird but i just like that sort of camaraderie and like connection that happens it's like Mm -hmm. um the best shows for me are the ones at like bars where we're just like in this like space together. It's like we're in this little spaceship and we're just playing rather than, Mm -hmm. you know, with our band, you know, sometimes you end up playing like listening rooms and coffee houses and they're all very like light and people are listening and it's almost not as fun as just like being in a noisy, dirty bar, getting drunk and just playing songs until yeah, two in the morning, yeah. you know? So I like yeah. that sort of like, I don't know, connection with the band. And we sort of sometimes get that more from practice than we do from some of our gigs, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I, I miss them. The year before the pandemic, our drummer went on uh 
like she moved to California. And so we had a, like a fill in drummer for the last few shows. Um, so we actually haven't had like an actual full band gig in mm-hmm. almost two years. And I think a lot of uh, musicians out there are feeling that same uh, struggle. Yeah. But it's, I, what I've been doing during the pandemic is trying to teach myself how to play drums. Uh, we mm-hmm. have a drum set. I've had it for years and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not the world's greatest drummer, but it doesn't stop me. And uh, yeah, I put on, you know, records and I play along with them. So I've been trying to like, you know, develop my skill as a drummer. That and one takes more patience gave... than guitar for sure. Like that one, oh, I remember yeah. I tried to learn drums before I learned guitar. Oh man. It, it takes so much patience to learn the drums. So much harder to pick up. Right. Cause there's all these like, yeah, to do. I wish I, I should probably get a teacher. That would probably be, you know, a, like a more direct path to actually learning how to play the drums. Right. But my brother gave me a bass amp over the summer. So now I, I have a bass amp, I have a, the drum kit and I have, you know, guitar and I have a loop pedal. So sometimes if I get extremely bored, I'll go in and I'll play something and then loop it and then play some bass and then just space out playing drums to it. Mm-hmm. Luckily we have a separate little studio house. So it's not like I'm playing drums in the house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Studio. Is it a, an electric drum kit or do you have an acoustic kit? Uh, yeah, it's an old acoustic kit. Okay. Um, which actually, I don't know if you've got time for another weird story, but that drum Go kit came to me because of this codeine tape that I made, this thing that you heard the two songs from. One of the people that I was painting houses with back in 1992, I gave him this tape and it changed the course of his life because he was like, oh, I can record stuff. He was a drummer before that, but he he's now like a, uh, studio engineer and um, fantastic drummer, but he gave me this drum kit like, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. He's like, I just want you to have this. I appreciate sort of like what you did for um, for the course of his musical career, which again, sort of humbling. His name is Matt Muir, Matty Muir. He's a, like a, one of the best Philadelphia session drummers and engineers. That's here. sick. And it's all nice. It's all good. It's a so, very wholesome story. I like that. <laughs> I guess I don't have anything but wholesome stories, I think. I don't know. There you go. The only other song that I guess I wanted to know about, because Smokes of the Wall, we got that that context, so that's great. Um, I mean, Healing Time, Cigarette Songs, you know, you can draw conclusions there. Tire String at the End of a Heart, what inspired you to write that song? Because I feel like that is probably the most beautiful song on the album. Such a nice piano ballad. What, where did that come from? Just that image of like a knot, like a simple knot. And it looks like the shape of a heart. And um, I believe I wrote that probably soon after we got married. Yes. So there was like uh, a lot of that perfect. marriage imagery in there. Yeah. But yeah, just a simple little song. Hydrogen Cars has a f- sort of funny story to it in that it almost never saw the light of day. We used to have one of those like early PCs that had, you know, like the Microsoft recording app on it. And I would just sit and, you know, play songs. And then sort of like as an exercise of, you know, whatever, I wouldn't save anything. I would just play the songs. But Heather, my wife now at the time, my girlfriend, she happened to just hear the last thing that was in there. She's like, what's this? I'm like, oh, just some dumb song. So she saved it. She like picked it out of the trash bin. She's like, no, that's a keeper. So Mm. uh, thank you to Heather for that. But yeah, the rest of them, that's the whole thing with our band is that we, we, I guess we sort of went for like earnestness. And so there's a lot of that in, in my songwriting. Like they're not that deep, like the healing time. That's actually about a time that I was healing from surgery. Right. So not that exciting, but what I remember about recording that, like those keyboard sounds on there. It's actually one of those organs. You remember like the, the people would have in their living rooms with the two levels yep. and then the foot pedals? Yep, yep. All of the bass on there, and actually I think the same for Chase Away Ghost, is all like played with my feet on one of those old organs. That's kind and of- I think I remember mentioning that the organ and the guitar just melded so well on some of those tracks on the latter half of the record. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, those were recorded in our, our barn. We don't live there anymore, but I had this barn at my disposal. It was like a three season barn. It was too cold in the winter, but I would spend so much time up there. Yeah, it was, I think, time well spent. Well, before we uh, end this interview, I always like to ask a silly question. So I guess my silly question for you is, how does it feel to be the creator of a genre, barn rock? How, how does it feel to be the... The, 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 <laughs> the innovator, the as it were. The proclaimant the of such yeah. a, a genre. How does it feel? It feels great. <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> yeah. It feels so good. It should feel I, good. I feel it mostly in my toes, but, you know... Um, yeah, I don't know. We uh, we hoped it would catch on a little more and there would be, you know, like barn rock festivals and other bands playing barn rock. But no, not the case. My dog is trying to <laughs> yeah. get my attention right here. You want to? Mm. Here, bud. Come on. Come on. In the chair, bud. This is my dog. No, it's <laughs> oh, on wheels. That's a lot of floof. That's a lot of floof. <laughs> well, yeah. Eric Herlock, thank you so much for being on our show and uh, just talking to us about uh, your music making process and such. It was... You're welcome. Um, can I plug a couple of things? Absolutely. Plug, it. plug away. All right. So for your listeners who are interested in you know my recording stuff now, the podcast that I make is called the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. So check mm -hmm. that out if you want. And... Uh, I make things on SoundCloud under Tinbird Shadow and sometimes under Tinbird Spectrum. So there's all kinds of weird recordings there. You know, like if this 10 piece album, I probably have, you know, a hundred or so weird little recordings like this. And maybe someday I'll, I'll put together another collection. But thank you so much for your interest in this one. And it really means a lot to me that this meant something to you so thank you well you're yeah, very, very welcome and thank you for coming and talking with us it's been great i enjoyed it immensely <laughs>